Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on Emergent Pediatric Ultrasound, presented by Dr. Brian Coley and Dr. Hamad Ghazli. The AIUM is pleased to present this event in collaboration with the Society of Diagnostic Medical Sonography. The AIUM is accredited by the ACCME. This webinar is designated for one AMA PRA Category 1 credit. By completing this webinar, participants will learn practical tips on image acquisition and be able to recognize the imaging findings from typical pediatric emergency studies. As an ACCME accredited provider, it is the AIUM's policy to ensure that the contents and quality of this activity are balanced, independent, objective, and scientifically rigorous. All individuals who are in a position to control the content of an educational activity are required to complete a disclosure form. All disclosures are reviewed by the AIUM and any conflicts of interest are resolved or managed prior to an activity. Disclosures for faculty and planners are listed under their names. AIUM staff members involved with this activity have no disclosures. At the conclusion of the webinar, you will be able to access the CME test and evaluation located on the AIUM website. Participants who complete the post-test with a grade of 70% or higher will be awarded one CME credit. Credits for this webinar are approved for physicians, sonographers, and radiologic technologists. During tonight's presentation, if you have questions for the presenters, you may type them into the question box on the right side of your screen. You will be able to submit questions throughout this webinar, but the presenters will not begin answering until the end of the presentation, at which time they will answer as many questions as possible. A recording of this webinar will be available on the AIUM <coughs> website. And now to begin, we're pleased to present Dr. Hamad Ghazli. Good evening, uh, good day today. Thank you so much for having uh this for us and thank you for uh, joining us uh, today uh, talking about uh, pediatric immersion pediatric ultrasound uh, as many of you can look at this lovely baby that you have but you and I know who have done ultrasound on pediatric patients how challenging it is undoubtedly the associated symptoms the medical history the physical examination findings the lab abnormalities definitely may allow the examining physician to focus on the differential diagnosis. However, we all know that a confident and accurate diagnosis cannot be solely made on just the basis of medical history, physical examination, and lab test finding. Therefore, what you can say, imaging plays a major role in the diagnostic uh, process. Well, here you can see a pyramid. I'm not saying, look, I'm biased for ultrasound, so that's I put ultrasound on the top of the pyramid. But definitely some of the imaging modalities that play a role in the evaluation of pediatric emergency is going to be sonography, CT, and um, R. But we all know uh, how important these imaging modalities are and how they complement and supplement each other. But when it comes to, to sonography itself, besides the non-ionization uh, and also the spatial resolution and the no need for sedation, portability, and uh, being an inexpensive uh, modality, the major advantages that we see when we deal with the patient, the pediatric patient, is the dynamic assessment of peristalsis, uh, the graded compression, the blood flow, the valsalva maneuvers, and effects of respiration. As a matter of fact, that's why sonography is referred to as dynamic imaging. You can see things as you are scanning. Another thing which is important for us in the field of ultrasound is the correlation of sonographic findings with the maximum point of tenderness, clinical data and lab results. You cannot beat that. This is what ultrasound can provide us when we deal with the uh, pediatric uh, patient. So now let's talk a little bit about one of the uh, most common cause of emergent surgery in early childhood, which is intussusception. Uh, usually occurs between two months and two years of age, even goes up to three years. 
it's referred to as the telescoping of bowel, where one segment, uh, which is the intersusceptum, invaginates into a distal one called the intersusceptiens. So in other words, that one segment of the loop of bowel is receiving another segment, uh, or the loop of bowel itself invaginates into itself. More common in uh, males than females for a uh, four to one ratio. The most common location of intersusception is iliocolic. But, you know, we can be followed by ilio, iliocolic, ilioileus, and colocolic area. Uh, intersusception uh, does have a tendency to recur in 10 to 15 percent of the cases, especially in the first few days post uh, reduction. Also, what we've seen for, for many of us who, have, who, who do ultrasound on the pediatric patient, uh, small bowel intersusceptions do tend to be small. Really, that's where they are. An incidental finding located mostly in the mid-abdomen and tend to resolve spontaneously and within minutes, um, and patients are usually asymptomatic. Here's some, some diagrams show you where the actually intersusception, this is an iliocolic intersusception, uh, where the uh, ilium is invaginating into the colon, uh, and that's actually how, how it looks. This is ex exactly this type of invagination. It, sh it gives you the typical appearance on ultrasound, which almost looks like concentric rings, but I will actually discuss that when we talk about uh, ultrasound and the sonographic characteristics and findings in such a thing. So now what are the etiologies? Some of the causes of intersusception that we, we deal with uh, most of the time, uh, they really don't have a lead point. That's the most common. That's what we say it's um, uh, uh, practically um, idiopathic. Other types of intersusception, some, some intersusception that do have lead points, which is less than 5% uh, of the cases, can be associated with Meckel's diverticulum, lymphoma, duplication cyst, intestinal polyps, uh, Hinoch, Chunlin, purpura, Putz, Jager syndrome, and of course, a surgery that could weaken the wall of the intestines and, and, and do that. Uh, what are some of the actually clinical presentations that patient, look, you and I understand, when we deal with the pediatric patient, it's not because they are a challenge, they're very anxious, they're stressed, they, if you ask them where it hurts, it's very difficult for them to tell us where it hurts, what, uh, what type of pain they have, very often we rely on the parents to tell us, and the parents sometimes, with all my respect, are clueless as uh, we are in some situations, we try to actually figure out what's going on, but some of the clinical presentations, some of the classical uh, cl uh, presentations, acute uh, colicky abdominal pain, uh, current jelly or bloody or mucus stool, and palpable abdominal mass. That also definitely depends on the patient's body habitus. Sometimes we don't feel that mass. But also some other type of symptoms that we do see with these type of uh, patients, intermittent uh, colicky cramping pain, vomiting, can be bile stained, uh, diarrhea, sausage shaped a mass. That's what we said if you are able to feel it. The concern about this whole thing this is what we do uh, as sonographers and also physicians. And you know, when we deal with this type of patients, we have to find what's going on in, in this type of situation, which is intersusception. If we do not diagnose it early, it could lead to edema, and if from edema, it could lead to ischemia and necrosis perforation and peritonitis. So that's very difficult for those type of patients. One of the things I've always found that's very difficult is this. We are not gonna go and fish everywhere. This is an abdomen. The peritoneal cavity is huge. We, you know, in, in the field of ultrasound, as you may know, we can make up, we can create, we can miss. So we, de we do need to survey the whole abdomen. What is the best way to look at to look at it? Number one, look at this lovely looking lawn down here. I wish I could do make my lawn looks like that to look like that. I, I'm a lousy. Let's put it this way. My lawn doesn't look as great as this, but this gives me a great, great actually depiction of the type of ultrasound I want to perform and the technique I want to use, which I refer to as the uh, mowing the lawn scanning technique. Uh, so practically that will allow that actually what we call it is transverse with alternating sagittal scan. So you practically start from one, uh, one, one side, let's say on the right side, knowing the most common location is iliocolic, so it's the right lower quadrant. But anyway, you go up, transverse, scan, skip a little bit, come down again, and by doing this, alternating methods, you will be able to evaluate the whole abdominal cavity. 
Uh, now the question that comes is, what type of transducer should I use? What type of frequency should I use? I would tell you it depends on the patient's body habitus. So there are some children that we deal with, and this most of them, you know, can be between anywhere between five and twelve megahertz. And again, you 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 decide based on the patient's body habitus. In addition to that, I mean, I will I will stay away from uh, sector array transducers or so. I will stick with linear array, whether sequential or first array, but at least they're there. Most of the patients, we scan them in a supine position. It doesn't hurt to roll them over back and forth to see if you can get better visualization, but the most commonly we use supine position to look at those guys. In addition to that, we do perform uh, Doppler on those type of actually uh, pathological entities. The Doppler itself can help us. I, I'm not sure how many of you do perform Doppler ultrasound on the on on, uh, on intersubstances if you find them, because they will help us determine the viability of bowel and the method of intervention. So that's what Doppler is all. There's no exam nowadays that we do without color Doppler. So what are some of the sonographic features of ultrasound? That's what, what, what's important. And I can tell you this, before I, can, I discuss the different sonographic features, I would like to mention, even though there may, may be some disagreement here and there, but the sensitivity of ultrasound in diagnosing an intersubjection is nearly 100% almost 100%. Surely, it depends on the operator. It, it's, it's that actually the great sonographers and physicians and radiologists and sonologists like you will be able to pick it up. So if it's there, you will actually diagnose it. Uh, the sonographic features of intersubsumption are straightforward. It has alternating concentric, hypoechoic, and acogenic layers, like I showed you that picture before, how these different layers coming together as that loop of bowel invaginates into itself or into another loop of bowel. So it really gives you the, the appearance of a target sign, donut sign, pseudo kidney sign. Uh, and you can go from there, and as, as many of those things that you come up in terms of the features. Uh, also what we've seen in, in there, I can kind of be honest, let's, let's, let's be honest. If it's there, you'll find it. You're not going to miss it. You're always going to say, what's wrong? What's this? Whether you know it or not. It's, it's going to sit in front of you and say, hey, it's a Kodak moment. See me. I'm in front of you. Um, so the complex, uh, also sometimes in the subsumption, they look like a complex solid mass. Don't be fooled. The reason it has this complexity to it, because what happens during the invagination process, and if whatever it is, whether there is a lead point or no lead point, when that loop of bowel goes in, it drags with it some of the mesenteric fat. It could drag with it some of lymph nodes. Also, in addition, in addition to that, sometimes can be some fluid, fluid that you may see in there that can be entrapped in there. Color Doppler can be very helpful, as I said earlier in the assessment of the reduction uh, of the intersubsumption. Where, when normal flow is seen with intersubsumptions, so most likely we say, okay, the loop of bowel is viable, there's no ischemia, there is no blood flow, so it's viable, and the non-surgical reduction can be successful in those, uh, those patients. Um, poor or absence of flow may indicate that's one thing, ischemia, which caused by constriction of the mesenteric vessels, remember, as the loop of bowel invaginates, it's going to drag with it some of those intestines and also going to constrict them and prevent the blood flow into that. So, and as a result of this, the non-surgical reduction of intersubsumption might not be successful. So the likelihood, the likelihood of reducing the intersubsumption non-surgically, whether you, uh, what I mean non-surgically here, I'm talking about hydrostatic or air enema, decreases if the fluid is found entrapped between the colon and the intersubsumption which could be a sign of ischemia uh, also, as well as the presence of lymph nodes can be uh, also in that category. So here are some images. If you look, this is the typical appearance. This is what I was talking about. You cannot miss this. Uh, here what you see, this is the intersusup uh, yen, that's the hypoechoic rim, and that's the intersusuptum, the agogenic center, that's the target center. So practically this is how usually the intersusuption looks, and really the best way in transverse, when you look at it transversely, it gives you that target sign. Here the same, the same situation, and here slightly oblique, you can see one of the loops of bowel entering, invaginating into another loop of bowel. 
uh, talk about small loops of bowel, sometimes you can find both of them, and that's what we talk about. They tend to be incidental finding. Res they do the resolve uh, very, very quickly, and the patient become highly asymptomatic. So you can't miss it. Here, another thing, this is a five years, one month old boy with abdominal pain, came in, you can see you put the transit, you go down to the right lower quadrant, boom, right in front of you. Again, that's intussusception, the hypochorocrim that we talk about the intussusception and the intussusception uh, is the center. There's a flow to it, this is a beautiful looking flow, that means hopefully it's viable and the reduction, non-surgical non -surgical reduction is there, you're on, on target. So you cannot miss it. So hopefully after today, you're not gonna miss intussusception. Here, then where things become slightly complicated, uh, what I mean by slightly complicated, because now it's not that what we looked at. Now we see, what we see in there is this intussusception, lymph nodes everywhere. There are some in, in lymph nodes entrapped with it. They got pulled with it. It has some complexity, but it looks like a mass staring at you and you stare at it. So immediately there you say to yourself, that's intussusception. You go obliquely on it, you stretch it out. You see the little tiny mesenteric lymph nodes in it, but there's still some flow in it. Maybe the non-surgical reduction can still play a role, but it may not, but again, you have diagnosed it and then the next step will be determined uh, later. But at least you say the patient does have intussusception. Another case for you here, that's this, and you see the intussusception, but again, you see some fluid entrapped with it. And again, that's intussusception and that's intussusception with some uh, entrapped fluid. And again, talk, we talked about the reduction, whether it's with the fluid or not, but you can see it in there. That sometimes make the uh, make it difficult. By the way, don't get me wrong here. You still can. You may be able to reduce it, but again, we're talking the difficulty increases, and the, uh, that's what we see in there, but it's still into susception. Now, let's move on to the next one. Uh, sorry about this picture here, but this is exactly how it feels uh, to us when we deal with these type of patients. Um, acute scrotal pain uh, definitely requires prompt uh, diagnosis for the appropriate treatment. Uh, the, often the differential diagnosis when we got patients, oh, rule out and, you know, includes infection versus torsion. In the absence of trauma here we're talking about. Uh, so when you talk in the, about this, about testicular torsion, so what it is, it is the twisting of the spermatic cord uh, or the testis itself on the attachments. What, what, what's the, at the end of the day is really talking about the, car, the cessation of the testicular blood flow. Now there's no blood flow, but you have to be careful. I'm gonna mention something about the presence of some flow in there, the trickles of flow in the testicle. Does it mean torsion or doesn't mean, or does not mean torsion? But that's highly important uh, to actually look at. Uh, it is a urological uh, emergency, accounts for 20% of acute scrotums of the cases, and peaks in prepubertal and pubertal age. You may ask, why it is important to have prompt intervention of these type of uh, uh, situations? Well, uh, the, the key at this point is the viability of the testes. The testicle in there, when you deal with that, you, they are, you cannot salvage it after a certain, certain time. So what happens in this one, testicular torsion can be reversible. And you can salvage and actually save the testes. If the intervention occurs within 24 hours, of the onset of the symptoms. So what does, here's some, you know, salvage rates for you. The best time is anything less than five to six hours. If you can catch it at that time, that means there's 80 to 100% salvage rate. Six to 12 hours, around 70%. And then uh, 12 to 24 hours, around 20%. And here you know, the, 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 more, the more time passes, the less likely the salvage is gonna take place. Now, well, we don't spend too much time talking about the type of torsions and the surgeons tend to do that, but maybe beneficial for us actually to address some of it, just slightly so at least we understand this. There are different types of testicular torsion. The two types I want to really talk a little bit about are the what we call them intravaginal and extravaginal torsion. The intravaginal torsion is the most common in puberty between the ages of 12, 12 and 18. Intratorsion, intravaginal torsion can also be referred. We hear about on the requisition that the requ request comes in, okay, bell clap or deformity or something like that. Here what they're talking, the referring physician is talking about intravaginal uh, torsion. 
and that's why we have to pay. So the, the is so what is that? And I'll actually show you some images. But very often the bell clapper deformity is when the tunica vaginalis completely surrounds the epididymis, the distal spermatic cord, and the testes. So prevents the fixation uh, to the postlateral aspect of the scrotal wall. This allows the testes, uh, the testicles, to move freely within the scrotum. So that's that's a big one. The extra vaginal uh, torsion occurs at the external ring, where the entire testes, the epididymis, and the tunica vaginalis twist. It tends to be more common in newborns, and it may occur in utero. Uh, it tends to be irreversible. And the clinical approach is not to operate on the neonates. This is what, you know, there could be some other situations, but that's what we see. And here there are some examples. If you look at this image down here, you see the tunica vaginalis is there, but it's not surrounding much. That's a normal, normal, uh, actually, uh, uh, lie of the tunica vaginalis. As the tunica vaginalis continue to slide up a little bit, we can see the distal the epididymis and the spermatic cord. And then this has a tendency. And look at the lie, by the way, of the testicle, almost horizontal in the testicle. It's not like obliquely in the scrotal sac. And this guy, as it comes in, it twists in there and prevents the blood from going through. Here you can see tunica vaginalis actually extending way beyond in there. And then as it turns, you can see how the twist, the twisting the spermatic cord. So that's not something, it's not like slightly, you cannot just let go of this very slightly, you know, quickly. You need to look into there and diagnose it there. This is actually, you can see, this is a, the, what we talked about, the uh, bell clapper deformity, uh, the, which is the intravaginal. You can see all everything lining at the same, practically the same lines horizontally, testicle horizontally, the spermatic cord tends to be very, there's no color picture in there, but just to show you sometimes the lie. Now I understand you, as, as operators or sonographers or physicians or so, we can make it look like that, but no, definitely this is the position and the location of the testicle and the spermatic cord most of the time. So what are the clinical presentations? This is tough. This is very deadly for us because sometimes we may not get the, the, good, the good story that we want to hear. But patients, patients with testicular torsion, they tend to present, they tell you, they, you ask them, say, oh my God, you know, all of a sudden I had this sharp, sudden pain. Oh, it came in here to my inguinal canal. They don't say inguinal canal, but to the side. Then you say, okay. And very often you look in there, you see unilateral scrotal swelling, a redness or arrhythmia is there. A uh, patient may experience some nausea and vomiting. They may experience low-grade fever, may become anorexic. And there are all these things of care. So now, some of the things when we patients, you know, we cut patient from the emergency room or some others, we said that it says the patient, one of the things has absence of the cremisteric reflex. Cremisteric reflex is practically a reflex elicited by pinching or lightly stroking uh, from caudally to cranially the superior medial aspect of the, of the thigh, and that allows the testicle to move up and down. So the presence of this reflex is indicated by the elevation of the ipsilateral testicle, which that, as I said, of that testicle. So now, if it's not there, then say, okay, rule out torsion. Another sign called the Prenz sign or the Pranzel sign, we see them on the requisition. We don't spend too much time talking about those, but those as they come from the referring physicians. And the Prenz sign is a pain relief when the testicular, uh, when the testicles of the scrotum gets elevated. And of course, the Pranzel signs is what we refer to as a high riding testicle. So as of doing all of this stuff and exper experiencing with this, as many as 35 to 50 percent of the patient experience gradual onset of pain, similar to epid epididymitis. And that's why I said earlier, it's either infection or torsion. It's one versus the other. So pain may be also in in intermittent. As the patient talks about, the, the patient may be going, or the test is going through torsion, detorsion, torsion, detorsion. And that's when the patient sometimes got some relief. So having said that, now what are some of the sonographic features that we see with these type of patients? Uh, simple. So when you look into this, uh, very often uh, the grayscale finding testicles in the early stage of phase can be normal. 
the acute phase, it has an acute phase four to six hours post torsion. The testicles may become, or the testes may become becomes enlarged and hypocomic due to edema. Late phase greater than 24 hours, the testes becomes heterogeneous uh, due to the hemorrhage and infarction. So it becomes, like I say, what's going on here? I don't want to use the term geographic distribution because when you say that, people think of infection, but it becomes heterogeneous and also the epididymis becomes enlarged and hyperechoic without hyperemia. This is a key. So not always whenever, when you see an epididymis that's enlarged, it's not always epididymitis, especially with the absence of the vascular component, increased in vascularity. And also some patients may present with uh, reactive hydrocele's. Here's some examples of, of uh, actually torsions, uh, some of the extremes, and here you can see, you look at the testicles, uh, it's very hypoechoic, uh, very enlarged, edematous, and here the same situation, you're using power Doppler, color Doppler, I'll talk about that later, uh, but again, there's no flow inside the testicle. I'm not gonna get too much into the technical, the technical components where you need, when you're dealing with torsion, very often what we talk about is you must, you must decrease your velocity scale, you must decrease your, you know, your uh, frequency, uh, decrease your wall filter, and all use different, whether you use power Doppler, or use B-flow, or use color Doppler, all of that stuff is in your hands, the great sonographer and physician and sonologist you are. You know your techniques, you, you must actually adapt and adjust and also uh, optimize your system to, to be the best. And here, you see the testicles becomes heter heterogeneous. There's some infarction and hemorrhage. Yes, this is actually echogenic, but again, you and I know. Dependent on the age of the infarction and the, ha the, the hemorrhage, the appearance is going to be. And here again, you can see very hypoechoic and highly uh, also adamatous uh, epididymal head. Where, and also you can start seeing some of the infarctions and the bleeding. Here, again, you can see them now, they're becoming hypoechoic. These are the infarctions, and sometimes you get some necrosis going on with these te testicles, dependent on how, how long they're there. So Doppler is actually a key. But people, when you talk about Doppler, you need to be able, that's what I was talking about earlier. Uh, so to the, in addition to the standard uh, sonographic examination, Doppler is highly essential in the diagnosis of testicular torsion. Well, any type of torsion, testicular, ovarian, what have you, you need to make sure that the flow is in those testicles. If not, then it's a different story. Um, remember, also in 10% of neonates, it's very, very difficult to detect flow. So that's how when you become the best and how to optimize your system. So the color Doppler shows either decrease or absence of detectable intratesticular flow which is uh, hypervascularity of the surroundings areas, tissue around the testicle, maybe scrotal wall or anything around the testicle. That's not inside the uh, testicle itself. There also, what we see, there might be an increase in the resistive index and also absence of reverse or diastolic flow. And you may see a monophasic waveform or what we refer to also as parvus tardis waveforms. So here, again, a patient comes in with a sudden pain, normal echogenicity, absent flow, 360 torsion on actually uh, in surgery. You can see normal testicle here, this is enlarged, and all of that stuff, again, that was proven by, um, uh, by surgery. Another one here, look at the left testicle, there's some flow to it. Then also the right, there's no flow whatsoever. You see some flow in the epididymis, but that doesn't mean it's there. Make sure you don't get any, uh, any noise in there. Having said that, now I come to the idea. Anytime you have an organ, a structure of two, less testicle, there are two of them. Ovaries, there are two of them. Uh, any side, compare sides, have sim symmetry, put them side by side. Say, okay, it's the same, the same parameters, the same variables. Put them side by side and say, do I see any change in those, in those uh, structures. So I always recommend to look at the other side. Just don't do one side at a time. I know you do that, but I just wanted to remind you in there. And here again, what we're looking at, this is the 16-year-old uh, with severe left testicular, uh, sc left scrotal pain and swelling. The right side looks fine. There's a flow to it. 
even though like you minimize your look at the wall by the velocity scale is too low. And here you can see there's no flow in the left side, but there's some flow in the surrounding and some edema of the scrotal wall. But again, hypochoic enlarged edematous you're good. Uh, in there again, here what we call the whirlpool, the whirlpool appearance. Again, you see it in the extra testicular tissue, uh, and at the same time, where the spermatic cord can be in there. But you can see the epididymis down here is very swollen, there's no flow to it. Chronic torsion in a 15 year old with severe right testicular pain for four days. Here you go. Is there salvaging of this testicle? Unfortunately, no. There's still, again, what we need uh, to look at. In addition to that, this is a patient. We have two-day uh, history of pain and swelling. There's not, and then what happens? The, the right side looks normal. Sometimes, if you can do it that way on one image, fine. And I do recommend to have dual images, one right next to the other. And that you showed both, but again, the left testicle was proven to be necrotic at surgery due to torsion. Here are some of the tricks. Here are what we need to pay attention to. Uh, looking at this is a 16-year-old male presented with 10 hours of severe pain, nausea and vomiting. At surgery, he had a 360-degree torsion. Well, if you look at this testicle down here, this looks, you know, you say, no, excuse me, normal flow on the left side. If you look at the, left, at the right, you see this high uh, increase in resistance with reversal of flow. Well, anytime you get something like this, you have to wonder. You should not get flow in a testicle that's high resistance like that. You look in here, the same situation. The left side looks normal. Then you look at the right side. There's some flow, maybe towards the periphery, but it looks like what we call it a very dampened waveform. We refer to it as parvus tardis waveform. Again, you should be concerned. That's why I always say, look at both testicles, compare. Comparison, my friends, always that. Here, neonate, I know how difficult it is. Yeah, right, you got very smiley new. No, it's got to be a neonate. A newborn is going to be screaming, yelling, pushing, uh, kicking, get climbing uh, on the parent's uh, body everywhere. But again, sometimes that's difficult. And here, this patient was actually diagnosed, this newborn was diagnosed with testicular torsion. Uh, this is one of the patients say, oh, my God, what we need to do to get this going. Here. I'll just pause for one second quickly here, so this way don't, there I know we are going to be running out of time soon. Uh, but again, here this is what do you think? What's your diagnosis in this type of patient? Well, simple enough. This is the scrotal sac. You see one testicle in there. You don't see the other testicle on the left side. What happened to that testicle? Look for it. This patient have crypt organism undescended testicle, and we know how highly prone, how risky it is for those guys to torse. And this guy has undescended testicle. Uh, which is actually a torse, and that's exactly what's going on with this type of patient. Next on there, uh, again, what is your diagnosis? This 10-year-old came in with scrotal pain for a week. For a week, guys, for a week. And then you look in there, this is the testicle there, that's the normal testicle. So what do you think this is? Well, where the calipers are, if you pay close attention to that, what would you say? Well, we know that we've seen a lot of uh, like, you know, appendages in there, and this is actually uh, what we see. This is a testicular, a testicular appendix. That's the appendix testes that has torsed and caused some pain to that patient, and it doesn't affect the normal testicle. Well, here we go. No more testicles. Let's move up a little bit to the abdomen. The next on our list is uh, what we call the pyloric. I mean, how many of you do pyloric stenosis? Well, many of us. Now, ultrasound is becoming the key for that. Pyloric stenosis is a practically, when you look into that, is practically is a tubular structure where it's a connection between the duodenum and the stomach. It's a connection between the duodenum and the stomach. It's a little tiny uh, sphincter type thing and has a circular muscle and that will allow things to pass through it from the stomach to, uh, to the small intestines. Usually the pyloric muscle is less than three millimeters. The pyloric canal length is less than 14 millimeters. The pyloric volume less than 1.5 cc. I am not sure how many of you are performing pylor pyloric volumes. In my own experience, I know what it is. We've done some of it, but it's not commonly done in our own practices. So just wanted to make sure that you, if you need Somebody asked you, that's the normal measurement there. Um, pyloric in the AP diameter of the pyloris around less than 13 millimeters. 
just wanted to make sure that you pay, talk a little bit about normal. And here where it is, you can see the actual pyloris there, the pyloric muscles, duodenum, and stomach in there. This picture is crucial, and I tell you why it is crucial in a few seconds. And now, uh, what is HPS, hyper, uh, hypertrophic pyloric stenosis? Very often we eat the word hypertrophic. We'd say pyloric stenosis. That's the thickening and elongation of the uh, pyloric muscle. What does when there's thickening and elongation? What does it do? It tends to lead to the narrowing of the pyloric canal and result in gastric outlet obstruction. Uh, the incidence is about three in 1,000 cases, and more males than females, four to one ratio. Most common, uh, more common in firstborn white males. It has also been reported in uh, children with type B and O blood. That's what it is, that these guys tend to be at high risk. This is what the literature says. The children, also the children of mothers with previous HPS are also at high risk. HPS uh, is seen in children between the ages of 3 and 12, with the 12 weeks with a peak incidence around the fourth week, uh, and which we're talking about here, almost 95%. Uh, of the cases. What are the etiologies, guys? What are the causes? There's so many, but let's, let's list them without going into details. Uh, most commonly it's idiopathic, but has been associated with prostaglandin. Now we're talking about, about that. Uh, also, uh, nasoenteric tubes, erythromycin. That's erythromycin is referred to mothers who take erythromycin when they're pregnant. So just to be on the safe side here, eosinophilic gastroenteritis, hypergastronemia, Apert syndrome, trisomy 18, and Cornelia DeLange syndrome. Those all have been actually uh, associated uh, with HPS. So what are the classical, the classical findings and presentations? What would the patient present with? Well, simple. Simple there for those of us who, <laughs> who deal with this, uh, this type of patient, they always hear about projectile vomiting. I feed my baby and off the immediate after, whoop, it has that. Well, great. Uh, we all know, I mean, just as a matter of fact, not every projectile vomiting is, uh, is going to be uh, associated with pyloric stenosis. Just wanted to make sure so you don't get somehow swayed one way. Oh, the patient will have it, just to be on the safe side. Palpation of abdominal mass, it's, they say it feels like an olive. Again, depends on the patient's body habits. Sometimes you feel it, sometimes you do not. Also, the patient have what we call it gastric hyperperistalsis. I mean, in other words, a swirling motion within the, in, within the stomach. There's no outlet. So it's going to do patients who would go through this uh, pyloric stenosis, they may end up with, or can be associated also with pyloric stenosis with dehydration. Electrolyte imbalance alkalosis, unconjugated bilirubin, and weight loss. So here, what we got in there. Now, that's why I want to talk about this. Techniques, techniques, my friend, this is the key. You're gonna, not going to fish everywhere. This is tough, especially dealing with intestines and, and all these bowels. So what do you do? Well, simple enough. Again, we already be beyond the type of transducer and the frequency. All depends on the patient's body habitus. We already determined that. Uh, that's what it is. But ultrasound is great. I mean, you, if you do it right in the hands of, great, of an operator, great operators, you will do, especially experienced uh, individuals, you're not going to miss it. Now, in addition to that, I want you to think of approaching, uh, approaching this in a systemic way. Number one, the first step, identify the pylorus. Look for the pylorus. But where would you look for that pylorus? That's the key. They look for that pylorus, that's the picture I showed you. I'm going to go, go back. I'm so sorry. Here we go. This is the key. This is the gallbladder. That's the pylorus. Make sure. That usually the pylorus is posteromedial to that of the gallbladder. Look in there. Don't fish around. Find the landmark and you do that. So here we go. Now we find it. Now observe the morphology of it. Uh, number one, pyloric muscle is hypochoic. Pyloric mucosa is hypochoic. It looks like a target or donut sign in a transverse plane. It does for all of us who have performed gynecologic ultrasound. It looks like a cervix in a sagittal plane. That's how the pylorus, we're talking HPS. Also observe the behavior of the pylorus. Does it allow fluid to go through? Doesn't allow it. What's going on? Look at that in there. And of course, look for what we call a Doppler evaluation for vascularity. Now, 
Well, usually don't see flow in, in, in a normal pylorus. That's what it is. But if I look at it down here, you can see that's the stomach. That's where the pylorus is very tiny, very normal looking. There's no thickening of the muscle and all that stuff. It's going to lead to the duodenum. Here, the same situation. Stomach there, pylorus sits there, and where it's going to go into the duodenum. Beautiful. This is great. If I take this picture, sorry, if I take this picture and this picture and compare it to this, obviously there's not even any comparison. So this is an abnormal pylorus where you can see the thickened muscle, this pyloric canal, I'll talk about that in there, but that's not normal. Here, if you look at that, and I want to identify, I look at the, see, the, the movement. This is the, this is the behavior. Things are moving inside. That's what's important. I want to see that moving. Here we will talk about the cervix sign again. This is the pylorus. This is highly, highly, this is HPS, this pyloric canal. Thickened muscles, more than three millimeter in diameter, is hypoechoic. Uh, again, the stomach, there's some food, milk in there, some fluid in it. This one I want to caution against, my friends. Make sure that you have symmetrical muscles. These must be symmetrical. So this one, this one, again, but definitely this looks, doesn't look normal. Here, the same situation in there. And this is the target sign that we will look at it, or the donut sign that we actually mentioned in terms of the appearance. So pay attention to that. You're not going to miss it. But you have to be careful, though, in, in terms of this diagnosis. Sometimes there's some situations that will mimic pyloric stenosis. And I believe I have a case like that that I will share with you today. So what is the techniques? What are some of the tips and the tricks? Uh, the pyloric stenosis is usually got the stand the stomach with fluid, preferably not milk. Milk is actually shadow, you can see in there. Do not over distend the stomach. Look, this is an over distended stomach. What it does, it pushes the pylorus, actually, which even, even actually uh, the wrist stenosis, uh, but again, it pushes it dorsally, all the way down. You can't even see it sometimes. Make sure do not over distend it. Uh, very often, we do not place any nasal gastric tube. We very often, we love kids, love sugar water, uh, which is 5% glucose in water. Give it to them. They'll take it as they drink it, uh, fill the stomach, and also don't over this time. But at the same time, roll the patient into a right lateral decubitus position. Watch the patient for at least 15, 20 minutes to make sure that goes through and that, that changes. So sometimes it's tough. You need to make sure that the pylorus is not spasming, and especially when you watch the motion, uh, the motion of fluid from the stomach into uh, the duodenum. Features, there they are. We talked about all of that, about normal. This is the abnormal. There's something called the nipple sign, which is actually the pyloric canal extends into the stomach a little bit in there. But these are things I already mentioned earlier, so there's no need to go back and tell you what's normal. If it's anything less, the diameter less than 13, anything greater than 13 is going to be abnormal. And also what we see with sometimes with pyloric, usually you don't see any flow with normal uh, pyloric, uh, pylor, uh, uh, pyloruses or py, uh, pylori, but again, uh, in, there's increased flow in the uh, HPS situations. Again, here it is. Uh, there's no, this is, Beautiful. This is actually, you can't. If you see that that one, you say, my God, I hit the jackpot. This is my Kodak moment. So take some pictures, and I will be happy to get some of those from you as well. But again, this pyloric stenosis, think of muscle, pyloric canal. If you want to measure, you go from here all the way across, all, all the way across. From here to there, you measure the pyloric canal, the AP diameter from here to here, all the way out, the muscle thickness from here to here, and then you're done. You're, you're really great. Here you can see that as you stand, the swirling motion. If things are not moving, watch here. Start quickly. It's going to be quick. In there, and you can see now the, the fluid starts to swirl. In there, it starts to swirl. Make sure when you see something like this, keep your face away because that's coming your way, my friend. Make sure you keep your eye. If you had it done and it was like a fraction of a second when I missed the vomit. So, again, be in there. So, what do you think is going on here? This is the first thing you look at. You see a pyloris that looks like this. Immediately you say, so, oh, yeah, right, this is pyloric stenosis. Here we go. We're done. Well, you remember, because that's going to be based on what you tell them, the kid may go to surgery. Here, let's see what happens. We watch it. We look at it. And there, now we start looking at it. You see some movement of air in there slightly in there. What's in there? There's something opening up. We go to the next series. We watch it. Look at the change of the antrum of the stomach. It's changing. Something is moving. Like it's not. It's not staying like this one here. Then again, you look in here. If things moving in there, and look at the duodenum. It's beautiful. Look in there. It's no longer the pylorus is very tiny, so the patient does not have 
any stenosis. Having said that, I really want to thank you so much for your kind attention, and it's always a pleasure of mine to present uh, my dear friend, uh, Dr. Brian uh, Coley, to talk a little bit more about some of the uh, other emergencies that we uh, encounter uh, in the world of ultrasound. Thank you so much again, and have a wonderful night. Excellent. Thanks, Hamad. That was fantastic. Those are some beautiful images. All right, so here's my, uh, my disclosures that we talked about earlier. And so kind of picking up on evaluating the vomiting infant, let's talk a little bit about uh, malrotation and volvulus. So these are much less common conditions than malrotation, but when you're doing uh, an ultrasound of the vomiting child, these are some diagnoses you may have a chance to make. Um, and if you can make them, you can be a real hero and do some, do some uh, uh, great good for the patients by catching these. So I'm not going to go into detail about all the, the details of what malrotation is, but it's, um, if you remember from doing your OBGYN work, you know, during the first trimester, the, the midgut herniates out um, into the amniotic sac, goes through a, a few gyrations and comes back in um, to form this sort of normal, uh, normal position of the intestines where you have the duodenum here going behind the superior mesenteric artery with the duodenal jejunal junction lying up to the left in the abdomen, and then you have the colon, as you see, displayed there, and a very long mesentery um, across the base of the abdomen. So there's the normal situation where you have a really broad mesentery, and the problem in malrotation is that you get a very narrow mesentery, and what can happen is that um, the bowel can twist. So this abnormally short mesentery can lead to a volvulus, and in that case, you get a cutoff of blood supply and the intestine can die. And so this is, you know, these are often ill infants, so they may be at a similar age um, as the kids with pyloric stenosis, or, although often they're younger. Um, they tend to look more ill, but we've certainly been fooled. They typically have bilious vomiting instead of non-bilious vomiting and pyloric stenosis, although that is not foolproof. Um, but it really is a surgical emergency because when they open these kids up, you can see um, these twisted intestines and it's very dark and dusky instead of a nice normal pink intestines because that's because the bowel is on its way to, to necrosing. So one thing you can look for when you're doing your pyloric stenosis is to look for the relationship of the superior mesenteric artery and vein. So in the normal uh, situation, the SMA sits posterior and to the left of the SMV. And if you want, you can turn on color and you can see you know, more of an arterial flow. You can put a cursor. But I'll tell you, you really don't have to because even in the tiniest, scrawniest infant, the SMA always has a little collar of echogenic fat around it. That's always the artery. And so here's an abnormal one where you've got, again, this echogenic collar of fat around the SMA, but now instead of being over here where it should be, it's posterior and to the right. And so this is a kid who would be suspected of malrotation. Now, this is not foolproof. There are false positives and false negatives, but it's an easy thing to do. As you can see, we were scanning this kid for malrotation. I'm sorry, for, uh, for uh, pyloric stenosis. That's a nice, normal little pylorus, not a perfect view. Um, and so we were suspicious that this kid might have malrotation. So here's just another example, again, scanning kids with, uh, that did have pyloric stenosis. Here's a normal SMA-SMB relationship, another normal SMA-SMB. Both of these kids have pyloric stenosis. But again, it's an easy thing for you to do just to confirm um, that there's normal rotation. As opposed to this child who came in with vomiting, it wasn't bilious, but he had intermittent vomiting, and we did uh, pyloric ultrasound, which was normal, but the SMA is in the wrong place compared to the SMV. And so this kid went off to get an upper GI study, and we're not going to talk about the GI manifestations, but this part of the intestine should be over here. So this is a child who had malrotation and went to surgery, didn't have to be emergent, but was found to have intermittent volvulus. Um, and so, yes, we, he did not have pyloric stenosis, did not need surgery for that, but certainly was at risk for volvulus and had been intermittently twisting. So the sonographer um, and the clinicians make the diagnosis here, did this kid a real favor and saved him a potential catastrophe. So the other thing to talk about is that uh, you can see back in 2010, there was some, some work in the, in the pediatric radiology literature that, um, that suggested that if you could see the third part of the duodenum going behind the superior mesenteric artery between it and the aorta, um, that you had normal rotation because anatomically um, that should completely exclude malrotation. And that makes complete sense anatomically. Um, it's caused a lot of sort of controversy in the pediatric imaging world. Um, but I think it's a good thing to do. The problem is it's not always as easy, like a lot of papers you read, it's not always as easy um, as it's made out to be. But it's another thing to see. If you can see the small intestine or, or the duodenum coming back here, you can confidently exclude malrotation. 
So the other thing is if you have your vomiting child, what are the things you're going to look for um, uh, for a volvus where there's been an actual twist and an obstruction? Because again, that's a surgical emergency. So Hamad showed that great clip of the swirling um, gastric contents when you had a gastric outlet obstruction um, at the level of pylorus. Well, here you're going to have an obstruction distal to the pylorus. So what you might see is a fluid-filled proximal duodenum. You'll see um, contents sloshing to and fro pour the py through the pylorus, bad gastric emptying, and then like signs of twist anywhere, you have a mesenteric whirlpool. So in this older case, um, there was this persistently dilated duodenal bulb in a, in a child who had um, uh, mid-gut volvius. Here's another couple of kids who came in for um, rule out pyloric stenosis. You can see that there's a dilated duodenal bulb. The pylorus is absolutely normal here, but you've got this to and fro flow because the duodenum is completely obstructed just downstream. And if you look here, the SMA, here's the SMB where you want to look and they are oppositely positioned. So again, another child, wide open pylorus, dilated stomach, distended first part of the duodenum that kind of comes down to a beak. And in this case, this is the typical twist you see of, uh, of a mid-gut volvulus on upper GI with just a uh, schematic to go along with it. So here's the mesenteric whirlpool. Again, here's the, the confirmatory upper GI in this case. I think if we were to see this now with the SMA in the center and then the mesenteric veins surrounding, wouldn't have any doubt that this was indeed uh, mid-gut volvulus. Um, here's not a great clip, but I think as it goes back and forth, you can sort of get the idea there's an artery in the center and you can see swirling of the veins um, around the central artery. Again, mesenteric whirlpool and a mid-gut volvulus. And just one more case, this was a child actually being looked at for pyloric stenosis and rule out intussusception. And as the sonographer went through here, you can sort of see a structure that at least superficially kind of looks like what Hamad might have shown with an intussusception. And it certainly looks like there's something inside of something else. But in this case, the key is that, um, is that this is not fluid. These hypochoic areas are actually vessels. And so this is a big swirl central mesentery in a kid who had um, uh, mid-gut volvulus. So again, the ultrasound findings, the SMA, and that should be SMV in the duodenal position um, are very useful for you when you're doing uh, your routine studies. You may see a dilated duodenum or a mesenteric whirlpool, and those are really signs of a, of a surgical emergency, uh, and you can really help the kid out by making the diagnosis. And while it's still often not yet primarily an ultrasound diagnosis, I think you can certainly suggest it, and in a lot of cases you can confirm it and save the kid having to have an upper GI. So I know we're short on time, but I think uh, you know um, uh, uh, appendicitis is still something relevant, and I just at least want to show you some cases. So appendicitis is still the most common cause for emergent surgery in children, and there's roughly an eight to nine percent lifetime risk of coming down with appendicitis. Um, classic presentation is periumbilical pain moving to the right lower quadrant with varying accompanying fever, nausea, vomiting, anorexia. Um, but those of you that take care of kids know that certainly in the, in the younger child, symptoms can certainly be atypical and the clinical exam more difficult. And like Hamad led off with, um, imaging often plays a role in trying to make the diagnosis or trying to figure out what's going on with an ill child. Um, again, you have your choice of, of imaging modalities. We won't go into it now. Um, suffice it to say that ultrasound really is the best thing to do in pediatrics and probably in adults as well. So in experienced centers, the overall accuracy of uh, pediatric bendicele ultrasound is about 97%. And very importantly, that, that uh, even if you don't see the appendix, if you've performed the exam well, if you're a reasonable examiner, the negative predictive value um, of this exam is still 95 to 97%. So I still hear people say, well, it's like if you don't see the appendix, you haven't ruled out appendicitis. And that is just not true. So if you don't see inflammatory process, you don't see an abnormal appendix, the odds of that patient having appendicitis are 3 to 5%, so it's still a very valuable, worthwhile test. And most pediatric centers use clinical pathways that use ultrasound first and CT very rarely or sparingly in problem cases. So ultrasound should be used first in children. Start with your high-frequency linear transducers. We get some pretty big kids, um, but still start with the linear. Um, you've got to use your gentle graded compression technique to displace gas and bowel and get down to where you need to image. I typically start with where does it hurt, and I only let them show me with one finger. If they kind of draw a big circle around their whole lower abdomen, first of all, I doubt they have appendicitis. But if they can show me with one finger, I start scanning right there. That's what I do. And if I don't 
find anything, what I'll then do is I'll find the ascending colon and I'll work my way down to the seco pole, find the ileal seco valve, and then I know that the origin of the appendix is going to be just beneath that, and that's where I'm going to start to look. So again, you do gentle graded compression, you know, don't bounce down quickly, um, scan with light pressure, I like to have a quick look around, then increase slowly. I watch my screen and I also watch the patient. You can feel if they have rebound, you can feel if they're fighting you. Um, so while you're watching the screen, you know, you may be distracting them with a video or a parent, but watch their face, see if they're grimacing. You can get a lot of clues that can help you interpret the ultrasound findings if they're not absolutely clear. Other movers that, I, that can improve detection are very important, and there's a nice article here that I've, I've referenced. There's, there's others more recent, but this posterior compression, pushing from the back while I push from the front, that's really useful, especially if you've got a retrocecal appendix, which is not uncommon. Pushing your transducer upwards, uh, we typically do these with an empty bladder, but sometimes using the full bladder and then scanning obliquely through the bladder into the right lower quadrant and sometimes flipping the child up, up on their uh, left side and scanning them that way can actually improve your detection. Because the location is very highly variable, as there's lots of schematics, but it's very common that it's a retrocecal appendix. They don't always drape beautifully over the um, iliac vessels like they do in the textbooks. I think in general you have to push harder than you think, um, as long as you do it gently. Occasionally using a curved array probe um, to get a bigger look, a broader view of the abdomen and pelvis, especially in a larger child. And occasionally you've got to look in atypical places, deep in the pelvis, left lower quadrant, right upper quadrant, and, uh, and reposition the patient can help you do that if you're struggling. So just a few things about the normal appendix. It's We're going to talk about size very briefly, and, and Kathy, you tell me when to cut off since we're at the hour here. Um, generally speaking, we talk about an appendix being less than six millimeters. It should be compressible. Here it is. You push and you can squish it flat, and it should have a very thin, well-defined wall. But that would be a typical appendix. It, you should see the tip because occasionally you can appendicitis just at the tip. Um, and it's okay if it's fluid filled. You know, that's still a normal size, as we'll talk about. There's nothing inflammatory around it. The wall is nice and thin. Um, so it's fine if it's fluid filled. Um, that's perfectly normal. The vascularity that people like to talk about is highly variable. It depends on your transducer, depends on your machine, um, and it depends on the state of the appendix. So yes, you can look for it. I don't find vascularity um, terribly helpful most of the time. So what are you going to use for the ultrasound criteria for appendicitis? So we've already talked about six millimeters is something that's, that's bandied about in the literature quite a bit and gets talked about. But as we'll see, that's not that useful. There is a range of appendiceal sizes. Um, as I show you cases, pay attention to the periappendiceal fat because if that gets inflamed and hyperechoic, that's really a great sign. And Andrew Trout, who's now in our group when he was up at Michigan, did a great study that looked at, uh, at that finding. If you had that finding, the odds ratio of having appendicitis was 69 to 1. And for those of us um, in, in our practice here, that's one of the best signs. Yes, it should be non-compressible. Seeing an appendicolith is not, is not foolproof, but it should raise your concern. Hyperemia, maybe. Um, and certainly if you see complex fluid or an abscess, uh, that'll tip you off that there's been perforation. So this is, a, this is a graph from Andrew's paper, and as you can see, the, the normal in gray and abnormal appendiceal diameters, they overlap. So yeah, you can pick six millimeters as normal, but there's a small fraction of kids who are going to have appendicitis at six millimeters. Similarly, if you pick seven millimeters, it's like, yes, you'll have more kids with appendicitis, but there's still an equal number that are going to have a normal appendix. So your accuracy really depends on what cutoff you pick. So if you pick um, you know, six millimeters, there's still 10% of kids who are going to have appendicitis. If you pick eight millimeters, well, 90% of those kids are probably going to have appendicitis. So it really just depends. When they look like this, it's a pretty much a slam dunk. It's large, it's inflamed, it doesn't compress. It looks very ugly at laparoscopy when they take this out. Here's another case. So we have an enlarged appendix. It's about nine millimeters. You can see the wall pretty well, but it is very hyperemic by any standards, even with power Doppler. That's a lot of inflammatory change. Um, a little bit of echogenicity in the periappendiceal fat, but not a ton in that particular case. Here's another one, another appendix, greater than eight millimeters. The wall's getting a little bit thick. It doesn't compress. You can't compress it. And the fat around the appendix, again, it's abnormally echogenic and thickened. This is an appendix that's, uh, that's on its way to necrosis. You can see great mucosal and bowel wall detail in the adjacent terminal ilium. 
but you can't see it in the appendix, which tells you that this appendix is starting to die. And necrose, still a little hyperemic, not as hyperemic as uh, the other appendices earlier. Here's an even later appendicitis as a larger child. We saw it much better with a, with a curved array transducer, big, dilated, huge um, uh, appendix here with absolutely no hyperemia because, again, this is a gangrenous appendix. And here's one that's fully gangrenous. You actually have air in the bowel wall, very abnormal um, thickening of the bowel wall. And look at all the fat around the appendix. It's very inflamed, very echogenic, very abnormal. Again, it's important to see the tip of the appendix. Here's one that was only abnormal at the very tip, a little bit of inflammatory change around it. For a machine of this vintage, that was a fair amount of hyperemia. And again, just one more case, look at the echogenic fat around this appendix. That is a really, really valuable sign. So if I can't find anything else, if I have sort of a borderline enlarged appendix, but everything else is normal, I will probably call that normal or at worst equivocal. If I see echogenic fat like that, I'm going to call it abnormal every time. Appendicolis are nice to look for. Again, just because you see one doesn't mean they have appendicitis, but be on the lookout for them. They can be rather small and discreet. They can have some posterior shadowing. They can be really big and plaque-like. Um, you can have multiple appendicolis occasionally looking like that. And again, if you see an abscess, um, that's a tip-off. Even if you can't find the appendix, if you have a right lower quadrant abscess in a child, odds are it's going to be a perforated appendicitis. So mimics of appendicitis, um, other things that can cause inflammation will be Crohn's disease, uh, Meckel's or PID. Um, diseases that will give you a large appendix can include cystic fibrosis, lymphoid hyperplasia. Um, but these things will give you a large non-compressible appendix but no surrounding inflammation. So here's a child with Crohn's disease who had an enlarged appendix, but as you look around, you also see a very abnormal um, ascending colon, very thick, and this is actually a fistulous tract, another abnormal loop with small bowels. So this is certainly way more than your average appendicitis. So again, if you look around and pay attention, you'll find clues that'll tip you off to this. You know, this is, this is a case where you have an enlarged tubular structure that's inflamed and abnormal fat around it. This ends up being a Meckel diverticulum, and so some people think, well, that's a, that's a failure. You missed it. It, was, it wasn't appendicitis. My opinion is you diagnosed the child had a surgical inflammatory condition that needed to be taken care of. I still consider that a success, but just realize that sometimes if it looks a little funny, if it looks a little short, you may be dealing with a Meckel. And then lastly, there's this lymphoid hyperplasia, which will give you sort of these hypoechoic, really thick, the muscular layer will, or the submucosa will be very, very thick. Um, and again, this, this can be a response to, um, to viral infections or other atypical infections. And so again, you get a fat uh, appendix, it won't compress, but there's nothing inflammatory around that. And these, these do not need to come out. These are not surgical cases. So again, appendicitis, uh, use ultrasound first for children. Don't be a very depressed. You can press harder than you think. Um, the size is important, but really pay attention to that periappendiceal fat infiltration. The accuracy, if you do it well, approaches 97%. It really is very good. And again, even if you don't see an appendix, you still have a 95% uh, negative predictive value. It is still a valuable exam. So lastly, very quick, since no one's cutting me off yet, is, um, is we're going to talk about the irritable hip very quickly. So in children, the irritable hip is defined by kids who come with pain and limitation of motion, and there'll be varying degrees of laboratory or other clinical abnormalities like fever. Roughly half these kids will have a joint effusion, and there are multiple causes. Um, the most common are transient synovitis and septic arthritis, but there are other less common entities as well. So Ultrasound is fantastic for looking joint effusions anywhere, and the hip is no exception. So again, a high-frequency linear transducer um, is terrific. Um, you usually keep the kids supine, the hip neutral. They will tend to want to externally rotate the hip if they actually have a, a joint effusion. Um, sometimes you can generally internally rotate. That'll make the fluid come into the anterior part of the joint capsule because that's what you're looking at. So you're sort of parallel to the femoral neck here. Um, looking down, and it's important to do to the right and left sides um, because a difference of more than two millimeters is considered abnormal. So while plain film, these kids will often get a plain film for, for osseous abnormalities, and you can see joint effusions on plain film. Ultrasound is much more sensitive by directly visualizing the fluid distending the joint capsule. So here you can see the underlying bone, the metaphysis, and the epiphysis. Here's, uh, here's part of the overlying iliopsoas tendon, and this sort of this uh, hypoechoic dark stuff here, 
that's the joint fluid. So again, ultrasound is very sensitive, fluid on the right, no fluid on the left, pretty straightforward diagnosis. Transient synovitis is probably the most common thing. There's often a preceding viral illness, but there often is in children. So whether it's virus, whether it's trauma, whether it's other some sort of allergic reaction is unknown. The symptoms are variable. They tend not to be as sick as the septic arthritis kids. They may have a mild sed rate, um, but their white count will usually be normal. So I, trust me, this is an abnormal plain radiograph, um, but it's a lot easier to see the joint effusion on the ultrasound. Septic arthritis has more variable ages. Um, the symptoms tend to be more severe. These kids should have fever, white count, a sed rate, often a C-reactive protein. Um, staph, strep, and H. flu are fairly common organisms. In the older teenager, um, gonorrheal um, septic joints are more common. And this was a 16-year-old, you see there's no physis, who had a gonorrheal uh, joint effusion here. The thing about it is that you've got to get fluid for diagnosis. Ultrasound can't tell you whether it's a septic joint or whether it's a transient synovitis or one of these other causes. So in the, um, in the clinical realm, this is a really useful thing, the, the Coker criteria. So there's non-weight bearing, an elevated sed rate over 40, fever of 38.5, or a white count over 12. And you can see the likelihood depending how many of these you have. So a lot of places that are comfortable dealing with kids, if they have three or four criteria, they won't bother with the diagnostic study. They may take this kid straight to the operating room. But if you have a kid who's, you know, who's a two um, and it's uncertain, often you'll get an ultrasound and maybe a hip tap. So again, flu ultrasound can't distinguish. You, know, you can't tell the nature of the fluid whether there's synovial thickening like this kid has, whether there's Doppler hyperemia, how much fluid there is, there's nothing about the ultrasound itself that's going to tell you whether this is infected fluid or not. But ultrasound is great for doing a hip arthrocytesis. So just like you can see it um, with ultrasound, you know, you take the same approach, you bring your needle down, um, just lateral to the uh, femoral vessels, um, and it's very straightforward to put your needle in the fluid and to aspirate, get a sample, and then you know what you're dealing with. Other things just to be aware of, if you start seeing bony irregularities, if you start seeing funny fluid collections elsewhere, um, this child had this as a subperiosteal collection. The bone should normally be very smooth and regular. Color Doppler, you know, Power Doppler had tremendous hyperemia, and this was all pus in the, uh, in the uh, periosteal region, and we got radiographs. This is all a very moth-eaten, uh, diffusely infected bone in this neonate. Uh, other things to look for, again, here's the normal hip. You have normal, nice, smooth, bony structure. There's no joint fluid. Here the bone looks funny. It doesn't look quite right. And like Hamad said, symmetry is your friend. This doesn't look right. And again, not to go in the MR, but all of this bright material here, this bright material here is all osteomyelitis and myositis. There was no joint effusion, um, but the kids certainly had reasons to have a painful hip. And then look for, for other abnormalities. Again, normal hip, we were looking for dysplasia, but there was also hip pain. In this side, the soft tissues looked funny, and as we looked around, there was a little break in the bone here with some reactive hyperemia in this child who had a, a fracture that ended up actually being a child abuse injury. And then one last one, pay attention to the soft tissues. Here's the, uh, the, the side that didn't hurt. This is the side that did hurt. And it's a little subtle, but this is myositis in the iliopsoas. So again, you may not find a joint effusion, but you can find other causes for the child's hip pain. So again, for the irritable hip, ultrasound is your best bet for looking for effusions. Remember, you can't tell if there is an infection, but once you've made the diagnosis of a joint effusion, depending upon uh, the clinical scenario, if you need a sample, if you're suspicious for septic arthritis, ultrasound will guide you very readily into the joint to get a sample. And like everything, don't just remember, remember to look around. Don't just focus on, on uh, the obvious thing, but look around at the bones and the soft tissues. So with that, I think we are done. Thanks to your patience for the, uh, um, the uh, technical glitch, I guess, with me. So if there's any questions, I think that's where we're at here. I think we have no questions right now, uh, Dr. Coley, and um, apologies for um, the webinar beast that it is that sometimes likes to trick us, and thanks so much for everyone's patience. Um, grateful to our presenters for this outstanding presentation, and on behalf of the AIUM and the SDMS, our thanks to all of you who participated tonight. Everyone, please remember to complete the post-test and the activity evaluation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation, and will join us again for future webinars. So long, everyone.